Mm-hmm. So this this section is um, is more it's not so much a, a presentation as to just to give you an overview of what we're going to do uh, in the EG Lab uh, this uh, next coming days. So it's just to give you an overview of the software for those of you who don't we've never used it. How many here have never used the EG Lab before? Okay, that's that's not that many, so that's good. And for those who use it, uh, just to outline the pipeline in which we go, you get the raw data. What do you do with the raw data? So EG Lab is a it's a collection of about uh, 600 functions. They're all modular, which means you can call them individually, and it's open source, which means you can check the code to see if we made any mistakes. There's less and less uh, bugs these days, mostly because it's been there for a long time. There is about 100,000 downloads over the past 10 years, and actually these numbers need to be updated. Uh, there's about now 15,000 people on the diffusion list and 10,000 on this discussion list. As Scott mentioned, we had funding from NIH since 2003. This is just a screen capture I did uh, I did this morning. And you can see that's, that's the number of people who start EEG Lab uh, this year. It ends uh, October 31st. And so there's about, every month there is more than 100,000 uh, people uh, instance of EEG Lab, which are uh, started, because every time you start EEG Lab, it pings the website saying somebody started EEG Lab, and that's the uh, that's the configuration they use. You can disable that if you're concerned about privacy. <laughs> <laughs> so you, this is uh, I don't know I, Scott didn't show this, so this is the survey you mentioned. It's now 2011. 2011, you can see most people who use EEG Lab, we use we process their uh, EEG data, use EEG Lab to do so, and this c- contains all the commercial softwares as well. This is so. This is our standard pipeline. So you have on the top, you have uh, group analysis. Is this working? Yeah. So this is single subject analysis. So you get your data. You have to process every single subject, and then once you're done with processing single subjects, you can process multiple subjects, and then you can do advanced scripting, and you can use all these EG Lab extension which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. So here I'm going to show you a bunch of graphic interface, and we're going to go really quick through them. So the goal is not for you to remember anything, more to give you an overview of what you do. The first thing you do is you start MATLAB, and you type EEG Lab in the right folder, otherwise it doesn't work. And then that's the, the graphic interface that pops up. Gives you a couple of instructions. What can you do here? You can import data, prune data, etc. That's just a summary of the of uh, this slide here. What to do with your data? So importing data. So you can you have three ways of importing data. There is native EEG Lab functions, and there is uh, some functions which are native. And here you see when it's in purple, uh, these are extension. There's actually I think about 22 different extension for importing data because every every time a new manufacturer uh, release a new hardware they want people to be able to process the data so they write sometimes the EG Lab plugin so these are made by not by us by other people and then we also allow people to use the file IO interface or the biosig interface which are two other MATLAB interface to import data so if you have a BDF file, for instance, there's like, I think, four different ways to import your BDF file. So if, for instance, this is all open source. So if, for instance, this method doesn't show you even the property, maybe the other ones will. So usually you have different solutions, so it's good to try them. Some of these functions are redundant, like, for instance, file IO contains a lot of the EEG lab functions, but sometimes they're modified independently because somebody fixed a bug there and not there, etc. 
But just to reassure you, most of these functions work, you know, 90, <laughs> 95% of the time. There's also a wiki page on the EGLAB website with all the data formats and the comment field. So if people have problems importing their data, they can put comment in the comment field. So it's good to go on that web page. And if you have a rare data format, for instance, you can see, oh, there's no importer for that. But that's the way people imported that data in MATLAB and then EGLAB. And believe it or not, this is the first step. And it's usually not that simple. Getting your data into the software is the first hurdle. If you have a standard system like you know, Neuroskind, Biosemi, EGI, etc., it's easy. But if you have a rare EG system, it can be a problem. Second, you have to import your events. So sometimes the events are along with the EG, which means like uh, your presentation software sent event to the EG machine and they register along with the EG in a separate channel. So you don't have to import an event in that case. But in most cases, you have a presentation file, or you have an e-prime file, or you have an external text file that you have to fuse with your data to get the full information about your task. So that's what you do here. And you can import presentation file. You can import e-prime file. You can import any ASCII file. You just define the columns yourself, etc. You can import a data channel, for instance. So if it's in the EEG and it's a data channel, but it has some special encoding you can you can use that function to decode these events and so that's the second hurdle and once you've done this you can look at your data so that's just the scrolling function you see the events here on the top uh, with numbers and these are seconds and you can scroll for your data next is importing your channel locations and again that seems easy but there's actually uh, dozens of channel location formats. EGLAB supports. Oops, what happened? EGLAB supports most of them. And if it doesn't, you, you can always you can always redefine your column with what they contain, like X information, and then you can stretch it, etc. You can do whatever you want with your channel location. This is, for instance, 256 uh, head, and then it's plotted on the top of the head. There's also a view that allows you to view the channels in 3D. So you've imported your data. Now the next step is what do you do with your data? So you can edit the dead set information. This is the sampling rate, all the basic information, name of the subjects, uh, all these things. You can look at the events. Define new events if you want. You can put some comments in the data sets. Then and, uh, look at the channel locations. Define new channels. Uh, define the reference channel, which might not be included in your uh, channel location file. Then you can pre-process the data. So very often, if you record, for instance, at 2 kilohertz with Biosemi, you, can't, you don't want to process your data at 2 kilohertz because it's going to take forever. And so you might want to change the sampling rate. Or you might want to filter the data if there's some drift. So filtering the data is actually five different filtering functions. There's also two extensions, two separate extensions to filter your data. You can pretty much, you should be able to find your preferred filter. You can re-reference your data if you want to use average reference, for instance. You can interpolate electrodes although we don't necessarily recommend to do that. If you have a bad electrode, you can remove it and interpolate it. We don't recommend to do that because what we usually do is that we just remove these electrodes, and then when we process all the subjects, they're interpolated automatically. And then interpolating the electrodes can also confuse ICA. So that's why we usually don't do that. But you can do it. And we reject data uh, by eye. So the first. So you, found, you have your data, and here you see you can drag your mouse. OK, this is muscle activity. I don't want this type of activity in my data. So you just remove it. This is a bad channel. You would want to probably remove that bad channel. So you clean your data like this. Then you might want to epoch your data. So extract data epoch. You put an event, like that would be square, for instance. If you click on that menu, extract epoch. 
the square that limits, and this is basically going to slice your continued data around events of interest. You can go back to these epochs and again do some rejection. There is, uh, I think, uh, six different automated methods to try to do rejections. There is also different extensions that do automatic rejections. You can, so you can reject the data automatically based on the spectrum. So if you have high frequency, you can reject the data based on the probability of the epoch, if, it's a, if, if you look at the probability density distribution of all the epochs, you want to look at the rare epochs, and, and this can do that. You have also a plugin that's called ASR. Here it's installed. So if it's in purple, these are plugins. ASR, Automated Source Reconstruction, which is another method that's, uh, that's cleaning your data. Maybe Christian will talk about that in his BCI lab session. This is, he, he designed this algorithm. This is now one of the most popular algorithms. And of course, so once you've removed the artifact, you want to look at your ERPs. Because you haven't given up on ERPs completely. And so you want to look what's in your data. Do my ERP look fine or not? And you can do all the basic ERP um, analysis in EGLAB. So for instance, if you click on this menu, you would see all the ERP of all the channels. And you can zoom in on the specific ERP. You can also use other menus to see the scalp topography at uh, different latencies, in either in 2D or in 3D. EGLAB is not designed specifically to process ERP. There is this. Uh, extension that's called ERP Lab. It's been developed by the Steve Lux Lab and that's much more targeted to ERP researcher uh, per se to process their data. But most of the ERP things you can do in EG Lab as well. <coughs> yes, as well as the source level. We'll come to that. Other functions to visualize your data are the spectrum. So uh, this is every single channel. So this is a spectral decomposition. John will talk about that in his next, next lecture. And look at this, uh, the power in different frequency bands. So that's 10 hertz, 20 hertz, etc. And then we also have uh, Zipping and Scott created this visualization uh, about more than 15 years ago. That's called ERP image, where you stack up the, the single trials and then you can sort them by an event of interest. For instance, I hear that would be the reaction time. And you can see, look at features in the data. So you've imported your data. You've looked a little bit at your data. And then you might want to uh, perform ICA, either because you want to remove artifacts or you want to use ICA to uh, look within the brain what's happening and perform source localization on independent components. To run ICA, you go to this menu, run ICA. Usually there's different ICA algorithms. There's actually uh, conferences which are only targeted at people doing ICA. There's hundreds of ICA algorithms. Uh, Scott will show in his presentation, I think it's next, that uh, we've shown that on EG data, most of them return the same solution. They just attack data different angles. Some use negentropy, some use to maximize independence of the components. These are different mathematical approaches. Even though they are all, this, uh, they're all the same in theory, when you have ideal data, they might differ on real data. We've showed that for EEG, most of the solutions are similar. And we've quantified that. This is our components look like. So these are the scalp topography. And then you can click on the individual scalp topography. These are the stack trials. So it allows you, this is a blink. So you see the individual blinks here. This is the spectrum. And this is usually enough information to say, OK, this one is an artifact, and this one is not an artifact. So you can tag the components here in this interface. And this is useful for group analysis. You can also do source localization of components using um, 
uh, banner rudiment model. This is not very advanced model. This is based on the average MNI brain from Montreal, 120 people. If you want to do more advanced source localization, Zeynep uh, Akalin here will do a demonstration on her EG lab extension that's called NFT that allows you to use the person MRI, the uh, uh, custom conductivities, etc., and very different. They're very different fine. Uh, forward model. Here you can also plot in the in the people's MRI as well. It's just more limited this approach. It's just to give you uh, here these are the dipoles plotted on top of the scalp topography. So once you've plotted components and you want to investigate okay so I've done all of this my, my data, I imported the data, I looked a little bit at my data, I cleaned my data and then you usually have a specific question. Okay, how does my P3 is affected by this type of stimulus or this type of condition, clinical condition, etc., or any other questions, auditory, <coughs> um, visual stimulus? And so, if you want to work with ICA, what you would do is that you would look at this uh, this menu that's like the contribution of independent components to the ERP. So this shows, for instance, and we'll go over this later during the workshop, that this component here, component one, contributes to most of the P300 here. This is the envelope, what we call the envelope of the data, and you can see the blue trace here is responsible for this peak. So that's the component you might want to look at. So you look at a couple of subjects to get a sense, you know, what, what kind of components that's representing uh, a source might might you want to look at and then you can uh, this can help you do your group analysis or maybe you don't have events in your task maybe it's just eyes open eyes closed and then you would want to look at the spectrum so in the same way you might want to look at the at the component that contributes to the spectrum here this is the spectrum at 10 hertz and these are the components which contribute to uh, to the 10 hertz the advantage of components over channels is that there, there are problems with using ICA. You know, it's not a magical solution. You'll see that. The main advantage is that it allows you to go down to the source level. And then you have much more uh, information when you're working at the source level. Because if you're looking at channels over the uh, forehead, it can be very well be source which are in the occipital cortex. So in terms of localization, you can't do any conclusion. So this allows you to make more fine-grained conclusion. My approach is still to look at the channel data and then refine the analysis by going into uh, components. Uh, if you're working with components or channel, you can also look at time frequency decomposition. This is what we call ERSP, event-related spectral perturbation. And, and John is going to talk about that in his lecture this morning. And this is ITC, intertrial coherence, or also known as phase locking factor, same thing. And John is also going to talk about this. So you've processed your single subject, and you looked at some feature you were interested in, and you want to now do multi-subject analysis. You have 20 subjects. You want to do inference about your population of subjects. So you would, do, you would build what we call a study. A study is just a, a shortcut for group analysis in EG Lab, where uh, this is the interface, so you just select your data files, and uh, you enter all of them here. Then you define what we call your study design, where you define your conditions, and in the, in the old study framework, which we all use most of the time here, you could only define two conditions, and these were two what we call categorical variable, meaning that, uh, for instance, you have three types of stimuli. So you couldn't analyze the statistics of reaction time at the group level. In the new study interface, you be able to define an arbitrary number of independent variables, and they can be continuous, 
they can be uh, categorical. It's also a two-step approach. So we'll go in detail over this, the old and the new approach for study analysis. Once you compute a study for both components or channels, you have to pre-compute the measures because you don't want to compute them on the fly. It just would be too long. For instance, if you have 100 subjects, it would take forever. Every time you click the plot button, if you had to recompute the spectrum of the URSD, you have to come back the next day. So we pre-compute everything on disk, then we save it, and then you can plot it. This is the plotting interface. Uh, as we will discuss, there's two columns in the plotting interface, one for channels <coughs> at the group level and one for channel at single subject level. It's the same for components. Groups of components will be on the left and individual components will be on the right. You can plot your ERP. You can see the, the individual subjects here in the ERP. We have this interface to group components. It's called, we call it a component clustering. And this will find automatically the components which are similar in different subjects. And similarity is a very hard to define term. And you will have to define it yourself. How do you define similarity? Is it the same scale topography? Is it the same spectrum, etc.? So you, you can define what you mean by similarity. And then we have functions to visualize these uh, clusters, this group of components. Here you can see every single dot is one component, and this is a cluster of components. This is the ERP, the time frequency decomposition. This is, for instance, the average scalp topography for the cluster and the individual components from the individual subject in the cluster. And so, and so once you've done that, uh, so that might be, might, might be enough. You might be able to characterize specifically uh, a process you're interested in. Like, for instance, you show obvious brain area is, uh, I have found a difference in activity, and that's enough for me. Or you can use more advanced tools. In particular, one of the reasons for the success of the EG Lab has been the capacity of scripting. Because, so in most commercial software, you have a scripting language it's usually limited. Here, the scripting language is, uh, is MATLAB. So you can do whatever you can do in MATLAB, you, you can do in EGLAB, basically. If you have your custom function, if you found a new process, you uh, compute the entropy in your data that's based on astronomy, and there is a MATLAB function, you can use it on your, on your EEG data. We've made We've made the, uh, the interface, the script interface also for non-programmers. So it means it's easy to do. In this is the EG structure. So EG, so basically, as we will see in the scripting lecture, you type EG dot something and that gives you the number of points, number of channels, the data, the components, etc. So it's very easy to access any information you might want on the command line. There's three types of, uh, as I mentioned, there's, uh, so there's three types. functions. There's the administrative functions that just check if these EG structure, which contain your data, did you mess up with it? Does it need to correct it? Because sometimes people change things and so these functions just correct automatically so it doesn't crash the software. There is pop function, which basically takes this function as input and does some processing on it. And this is what we call low-level function, which don't make any assumption about the type of information they get in. So you just enter arrays into this question. I heard of people using ERP image, for instance, to look at uh, astronomy data, just because they thought it was relevant for the type of uh, study they were doing. So this just assume arrays. So three level of function. This function take EEG structure as input and then usually convert interface to these low level function. Also the advantage of EEG lab and one of the reasons is of its success is that it's writing scripts for you. Whenever you're using the interface and clicking places and entering 
uh, information in the GUI, it's automatically writing a script with everything you've done. So at the end of your session, you're, you type EGH, it's going to give you the script. If you copy that to your MATLAB script and you run it, it will redo everything you've done on the GUI. So you don't need to be a script expert. And now you want to process another subject, well, you just change the file name. And obviously, you might have to change other things because you might not want the same rejection to be done to that subject. But that's just the spirit. So this is the kind of script we'll be writing. This is, for instance, a study script that just uh, imports the data from all the subjects, uh, create a specific study design, compute ERP, and then export the ERP to uh, uh, Excel sheet, the ERP result to Excel sheet, the group analysis to Excel sheet. In this workshop, we also have uh, parallel sessions. So one is going to be about SIS, the source information flow toolbar of uh, Tim Millen that plugs in on top of uh, EEG Lab to do source reconstruction analysis. We also have BCI Lab and uh, LSL, Lab Streaming Layer. So if you do any, if you work with any kind of, uh, any kind of the custom hardware, these days everybody uses the Lab Streaming Layer. That's also an open source software that was created in our lab and they have a separate conference about lab streaming layer. And lab streaming layer is basically a system that just streams data. So you have your EEG, so it streams data, and then you have your controller, streams data from that. I, I um, oculometer streams data from that, and just reconciles the data and timestamp it. So you can use it for further analysis. So this is very useful for mobile, brain analysis when you have lots of information stream, you can also uh, synchronize video. And so we're lucky to have here, so Christian is the one who created it in this lab. So he's going to be here talking about that and also about BCI lab, which is on top of lab streaming layer and that allows you to do real time analysis using uh, lots of the EEG lab uh, functions. We also have Zeynep, she's going to talk about uh, forward modeling, some more detail forward modeling when you have the MRI of a subject and you want to create your own lead field matrix to do forward modeling based on the physiology of a specific subject and also all the problems associated with uh, um, determining the conductivity. She has published many papers on that and this is her EEG lab extension. So she's going to talk about that in her session. And then we'll have other sessions. The, I wanted also to mention what are the pros and cons of uh, using MATLAB. The pros are, uh, as, a, as, the, as the base of the software, there's uh, other options these days, like for instance, Python. The pros of MATLAB is that it's easy to program, highly extendable. It's not dependent on any platform. For instance, we run all of our analysis here at the supercomputer, or you can run it on your laptop, same code. We also have a project to, uh, running on a bunch of supercomputers in, in the US. There's also a large community of users. So if somebody comes up with a new algorithm, it's probably going to be available in MATLAB, so that's convenient and also it has very uh, powerful scripting capabilities. The cons is that you have to pay for MATLAB and it's pretty expensive. Usually university pays, so that's fine, but sometimes it comes out of your grant and if you can avoid it, you know, you'd rather save a couple of thousand dollars. Also it has usually large memory requirements. That's not so much an issue these days with the modern machines, but uh, there's also MATLAB bugs and possible version differences with iron that for you so it should work for all of you but if you go to the specific ex extension you will see how that plays out like you can't use that with that version of MATLAB or you can't use that you should be able to all use EG Lab here as long as you have like 2007 a MATLAB 2007 or later if you have the older version you can always download the older version of EG Lab that's going to work with these versions but 
that's the problem. And also the graphic interface is not very sleek. You know, you start it on, on uh, Linux, it's going to be looking very different from, if you, from starting it on Windows. So that's a little bit of a uh, problem. I'm a big advocate of MATLAB versus Python, and we can discuss for hours about that. Python is more a uh, programming language for programmer, uh, and, and you, have to be, you have to be pretty, not necessarily advanced, but you have to know some programming to be Python, just because you just don't start Python. You have to install all these libraries, it might take you two days to install the libraries for everything to work, etc. It's not out of the box. And I do think MATLAB is, is easier if you just want to get the thing done. You know, you just want to analyze the data. You don't want to spend your day installing libraries or learning this computer language where index starting at zero, while, you know, first element should be one. <laughs> so, <laughs> lots of things like that. R is also a very good alternative to MATLAB. I, R is, is much closer to MATLAB if you want to process the data. What's about Octave? You Octave. So EGLAB is compatible with Octave. So for instance, when we run on supercomputer, we're trying to use Octave because then we don't have to pay for all these MATLAB licenses. One issue with Octave is that the code is not very optimized, so it usually runs three times slower than the MATLAB code. It usually returns the same output. Now Octave has upped uh, their uh, graphic interface. So we have somebody working on making the EGLAB graphic interface fully compatible with Octave. So then you can use Octave. If you, want, if you don't want to use MATLAB, we also have a compiled version. Like for instance, we have somebody in New York that's using EGLAB to, um, for a bunch of schools. And so they use the compiled version. This way they don't have to uh, pay for MATLAB. So Octave is a, is a okay alternative if you do command line right now everything is going to work but if you do uh, graphics almost nothing is going to work but it could change next year because they just changed their uh, graphic interface these are some of the eg lab articles that, uh, that contain most of the things we'll be working at the workshop there's also online a free uh, almost 300 page tutorial where you can go back and uh, it's guided there's also online workshops so this is um, to finish I'm going to give you an overview of what we will do so Scott is going to talk so we'll have a coffee break right now then Scott is going to talk about ICA theory and evaluation so what is ICA? How does it work? Then John is going to talk about time frequency decomposition. So these are all lectures. Then we'll have a short, uh, we have lunch. And lunch is on your own. We have maps. Basically the campus is right here. There's food court, etc. It's just like five minutes walk. And then after lunch, we'll have short intro on BCI lab and SIFT, 15 minutes each. So they can tell you what you will do in their respective uh, parallel sessions. There will be the main parallel session will be here. It's going to be a basic EG lab processing by Julie Anton, who's a all-time user of EG lab and, and Luca. And then in track B, so upstairs, we'll have a BCI lab and then we'll have uh, Tim Mullen is going to talk about source information flow, connectivity analysis. And he's going to present exactly what he's going to say. He has two sessions. Tomorrow, again in the morning, it's all the lecturers are here. And uh, Zainab is going to talk about source localization. I'm going to talk about statistics in EG Lab. And Cyril Turner from the University of Edinburgh is going to talk about GLM statistics. So this is the new type of statistics that is currently being implemented in EG Lab. You have lunch, and then the parallel session, we'll have um, a session here in the main auditorium on general linear model and the new EEG lab. So that's a new version of EEG lab that's not been released yet for you, the beta users. And not everything is working. Most of the things are working, but not everything is working. And this 
this version truly supports the GLM. So that's where you can, you know, you can define arbitrary number of variables. You can include all your continuous variable in your design. You can do any kind of statistical analysis you want with your data, basically. Then the second part of the session is Zainab. She's going to talk about the NFT toolbox, and so there will be practicum as well, how to use that. And Tim will do a more advanced lecture on source information flow. By the way, for this part of sessions, you are free to move around. You don't, you know, if you sign up for a session, you don't, don't feel like you're stick, you know, you have to stick with your choice. You can go to other sessions. The third day, Scott is going to talk about clustering. I'm going to talk about how to perform cluster analysis in EG Lab. And then we'll go for an excursion to the Torrey Pines Reserve and have a picnic on the beach here in Torrey Pines. And when we come back, uh, we'll have three uh, parallel sessions, again, which will be introduced here by John Scott. The basic track, I'm going to conduct this track. It's going to be on EG Lab scripting, some more basic, both basic and advanced scripting. And uh, John is going to talk new EEG tools and measures, MEG analysis. Makoto is going to talk about phase amplitude coupling, group level analysis. Luca is going to talk about this uh, tool for automatic uh, ICA uh, tagging. And Nima is going to talk uh, with the previous uh, member of the lab, is going to talk about the technologies developed to tag EEG data and do massive meta-analysis of EEG data. Then another part of session is going to be by Scott and Zipping on mobile and brain imaging, how to do recording. I think there's going to be a demo of lab streaming layer and, uh, and also uh, MobiLab. And Zipping is also going to talk about his uh, brain computer interface and real world uh, neural imaging. And on the last day, Monday, we'll have last Scott's last lecture about mining event-related dynamics, and then we'll have about two hours where you can work on more examples. We can help you uh, here either to work on your own data or some examples you might want to come back to, so we have two hours for this. We also have, for those of you who want to do that, we have presentations, which means like you come up with one slide of something you've done with the workshop and you would want to discuss, for instance. So it's, it's, this can be on your own data, or it can be on the data you've used here. And we'll close at about 12. So that's it. So now we have a break. Unless there's specific questions, but, uh, you can just reach me for, for questions during the break.